بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين In the previous session, we talked about the history of Arabs and how different religions came into Arabia. And we talked up to the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before talking about the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would just like to talk about the preparations made for the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very briefly. So at least we will see what type of preparations were made for him and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was laying the grounds for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in other words, for that change that was supposed to come in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Khatamun Nabiin will be the last of the prophets. And he will come at the end. But still we find that all the Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam they were told about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam They told their ummah about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wa salam in Quran, that he said to his people, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ That I came to give a glad tiding, a good news of a prophet that will be coming after me whose name will be Ahmad. So previous Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam were talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they were telling their ummahs that a prophet is about to come. Whose attributes will be like this, whose qualities will be like this, this is how he would do the work. And not only about him, previous books were even talking about his followers. Here I remember A hadith which is in Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya by Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah. That when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam received the Torah and he read the Torah, in Torah he found description of this ummah with very high words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that were Admiring the Ummah, talking very highly about the followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, when he read about this Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he started making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma ja'alhum ummati. Ya Allah, Make them my ummah. I would like my followers to be like these. Imagine when a prophet of Allah request Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have people like those. And he says, I like these people to be my followers, ya Allah. 
how high of those qualities might have been that were mentioned in Torah about this Ummah, that Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam is hoping his followers to be like those. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied, لا تلك أمة أحمد No, that will be the Ummah of Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, when he received the Injil, and he read the description of this Ummah in Injil, he was amazed. And he made the same dua, Allahumma ja'alhum ummati, ya Allah, I like these people to be my followers. And again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, la tilka ummatu Ahmad, no, that is the ummah of Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So those books talked about this ummah. As we find, in the history of Sayyidina Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu, and in the history of Al-Qudus, when Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een were over there, and there was about, a, for a war about to start, those people said, we have some description of the person who would take over Jerusalem. We don't know if you are the people or it's someone else. But to us it looks like you might be the people who would take over and that decision can be made only after we see your Khalifa, your ruler. Some of the histories even mentioned that at that time, some people decided, why call Umar radiallahu anhu all the way from Medina? Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu used to resemble Umar radiallahu anhu in his look. And the look that is, that the books of Sirah mention about Khalid bin Walid and Umar radiallahu anhu was tall people. So tall that when they used to sit on the camel, their feet will be touching the ground. With a big chest, wide chest. Sign of strength and power. And we don't want to change the topic, but we know that Umar radiallahu anhu fighting the jinn and beating him up a couple of times. And Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, you can just keep on talking about him. During one of the battles, they made a plan against Khalid radiallahu anhu because they knew this is the person that there is no way we can defeat that army as long as this person is there. They were afraid of his name. As soon as they would find out that Khalid bin Walid is going to be there, that's it, they will run away. People don't want to confront him. If you read the books of history, you will find that sometimes it happens so that thousand people, thousand people will make a plan and they are surrounding one person, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, and he would come out of those people. Imagine thousand swords are on someone's head. And he is able to make it out of those safely. So they planned, they had some very strong people too. So one of the times when the, one of these situations, when they made a plan against him, they said, they will call Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu for a meeting. And the message was sent to him was, that we would like to have a treaty with you people, so that you people will rule as we are happy with you people, and these types of things that will make him come. And Khalid bin Walid will go over there without any weapons and their leader will come without any weapons. And no one else with them, these will be the only two people to talk over there. And of course, Muslims sensed it, that these people are making some plan. With all of these conditions. 
And what their claim was, we are afraid that you people might trick us and kill our leader or something. This is why we want you to come without any weapons and no bodyguards, no one. And even he would come without anyone, having anyone with him and no weapons at all. So people said to Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, it looks like they have some plan. And of course, one of the very simple thing everyone could think of was, some other people will be hiding there. And this person will try to find an opportunity where he would hold Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu and they would come and attack Khalid radiallahu anhu from his back. Of course, when they would come, they will have their weapons with him, with them. And here, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu said, don't worry about it, Allah will help. And he went there. And that person talked about the treaty and everything. And of course, that was all just plan, senseless talk, and at the end, according to the plan, he was supposed to grab Khalid radiallahu anhu, hug him, say, okay, we had a very good meeting, and we will have a hug. And during that hug, he will hold Khalid radiallahu anhu, and keep on holding him, and then of course, those people are watching, hiding from behind a rock or something, they're watching, they'll jump on Khalid, on Khalid radiallahu anhu. This was the plan. So, when they went for a hug, and that person held Khalid and he said, come on now. So Khalid radiallahu anhu realized it's a plan. He squeezed that person so hard that the person died right there. So that person got a real good hug from Khalid radiallahu anhu. Subhanallah, it was the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed these people with such a strength. So, they said Khalid radiallahu anhu resembles Umar radiallahu anhu. Let's present Khalid. When they looked at Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu right away, they said, then you are not the people who would take over Baytul Maqdis, who would take over Jerusalem. So then they said, no, no, this is not our Khalifa. We will call our Khalifa. And they wrote a letter to Umar radiallahu anhu. And we know Umar radiallahu anhu went there and they looked at Umar radiallahu anhu with everything that they found in their books that was exactly fitting the description of Umar radiallahu anhu. And they handed over the keys of Jerusalem to Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een without having a war. This tells us that their books not only talked about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they talked about even the Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'in and the Ummah. So this was one way of preparation. That their books will be talking, were talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and about his followers. Nowadays a lot of people of course they talk about this topic. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his description in the Bible. Because of course, that Torah and Injil that was revealed to Sayyidina Musa and Isa alayhi wa salatu wa salam, and Zabur that was revealed to Sayyidina Dawood alayhi wa salatu wa salam, they all talked about him in detail, but they are changed. But still we find, after all of those changes, there are places in these books that talk about someone's coming and that description fits only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But still we need to remember the fact that this is neither here nor there. It will not be presented as a proof. And if we talk about it at any time or if we find any description of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in those books, it's not to prove that he's a prophet of Allah because he is mentioned over there now. No, these books that said they're changed. So even if they won't talk about him, or in future these things now they will find out, okay, Muslims found something that they see as a description of their prophet. So let's change it in the next version. And of course it's being revised every some time. So the next revision is taken out. It won't affect us. But only for those 
that are not believers yet. And they may take the, the Bible as an authority. For them it might be helpful to see these type of descriptions that is fitting on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that might help them see the truth and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those books talked about it and after all the changes still there is some hint towards these things. There are many places that talk about it but amazingly one place is so clear that it mentions the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was surprising to see that and something like that would exist up to now. And that was, when I was looking for it, in the Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 16. Now, I will read the translation, look at it. It says, His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. He is altogether lovely is a translation of a Hebrew word. In the Bible that is in Hebrew, it says, His Muhammadim. This is the Hebrew word for it. He is Muhammadim. Now, I am at the end, dim. I am at the end is plural. Just like in Arabic, as a respect, we have plural we use plural uh, form of it. Same thing in Hebrew, they use plural as a respect. Inna nahnu dhikra. We revealed the Quran. We, Allah is referring to himself. I revealed it, but she says we revealed it as a respect. So I am at the end in Hebrew means plural. And Muhammad in Hebrew means being admired all the time. And this is why it's been translated as altogether lovely. But the word is used, Muhammadim. And we find it's just like, it's the same word, the same name is being used. Of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then of course there are many verses over there that talk about someone coming from the cousins of Bani Israel. Now their cousins, of course, Sayyidina Ishaq and Ismail alayhi salatu was salam. They are the children of Ishaq alayhi salatu was salam. And their cousins will be only the children of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam. And that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then up to now, there are verses that talk about his hijrah, his immigration after being tortured. And these type of things are there. So this was one thing that we find. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the previous books and to the previous Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam about the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The point I was mentioning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that he will be the last of the messengers, still he is mentioning it to all the messengers as a respect for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This reminds me there is a hadith in At-Tabrani Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu anhu have narrated the hadith. Very interesting hadith. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu says that my father informed me, which means Abu Sufyan, who was the leader of the Kuffar of Quraysh at that time. He said, after Islam, my father one day he informed me. He said, Umayyah bin As-Salat, who was one of the leaders of Quraysh at that time also. He said to me, Inni ajidu fil kutub, Sifata Nabiyyin Yub'athu Min Biladina. I, when I started studying the other books, the books of other religions, I found the description of a person who would be sent to us and he will be from our, and it's not really sent to us, who would be coming from our town. A prophet who would come from this town. So Umayyah bin As-Salat now says, this is what Mu'awi radiallahu anhu writes in the authority of his father, Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhum ajma'een. He says, Umayyah bin As-Salat said to me, that wa kuntu azunnu anni huwa. I always thought I will be that person. A person who would get the prophethood from this town, because I thought I'm the one who really 
fits that high qualities of that Prophet that can, that can come from the stone. Then when I studied even more, I knew that that Prophet will be from Bani Abdul Munaf, the clan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That means it won't be from my clan. He said when I realized that, then I started studying even more and I started looking at those people of Bani Abdul Munaf and I could not find anyone that would be suiting for that position except for one person and that was Utbah, Utbah bin Rabi'ah. One of the, again, one of the leaders of Quraysh. But then I said to myself, that in those books, as part of the description, it says that that person would receive the prophethood at the age of 40. Utbah bin Rabi'ah is older than 40 now. So it can be him. Walam yuha ilayh. He did not receive the revelation, so I knew that it will be someone else. So Abu Sufyan says, Umayyah bin As-Salat told me all of this long before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa coming and before he received the prophethood. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa received the prophethood, Abu Sufyan says, one day I went to Umayyah bin As-Salat, I remembered this conversation. So I went to him and I said to Umayyah bin Salat, Umayyah, remember that conversation that we had about a prophet that was going to come? What do you think about him? He is from Bani Abdul Munaf. And all the description that you are talking about it are really very fitting on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With his morals, with his behaviors, with everything on him. So he said, Umayyah said to me, أَمَا إِنَّهُ حَقٌ فَاتَّبِعَ He is true, um, truly a messenger of Allah. You should follow him. So he said, then my next question was, How about you? How come you don't follow him? So he said to me, الْحَيَاءُ مِن نِسَاءِ ثَقِيف I'm ashamed of our women, of our clan, because I always used to tell them I will be a prophet. And all of a sudden, they will find me being a follower of a prophet. So they will look down at me. Therefore, I cannot follow him, but I know he is the true prophet of, uh, and a messenger of Allah. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah has narrated that there was a sahabi whose name was Salama bin Waqash radiallahu anhu. Salama bin Waqash radiallahu anhu says, We had a neighbor in Medina Munawwara who was Jew. One day he came to us and he started talking to us about Akhirah, about the punishment in the grave, about Jannah, about Jahannam and these type of things. So we asked him, How do you know all of these things and what is the sign of what you are saying is true? Because you're talking about something that cannot be seen. So there must be some sign of your truthfulness. So he said, yes, my sign, the sign of my truthfulness is that soon a prophet would come who would mention all of these things and he would talk about these things. So he asked him, when would that prophet come? He started looking around. Then he looked towards the skies and he, he said, I was, he said, I was the youngest person over there. I was a young boy. He pointed towards me and he said, if he will live a normal edge, he would be seeing that Prophet of Allah. So Salama bin Waqash radiallahu anhu says, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the prophethood even before that person died. But we believed in him because of knowing, because of hearing all of that from those people. And they rejected him because of arrogance and because of his stubbornness. That how come a prophet came from someone who is not of our clan or who is not of one of our uh, followers of our religion. So that was their main reason for rejecting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in those books, 
we find a very amazing ayah in Quran that tells us that not only that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in those books, and he informed the prophets about the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, <coughs> there was some other step was taken that is much more important and stronger than just mentioning it. And that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before sending any prophet to the world, the time when he created Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu was salam. And then he selected Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam out of the children of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu was salam. As we know, Quran talks about وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَنِي آدَمَ مِن ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ Before creating any human being, Allah gathered all the human beings at that time, which means our soul. And He asked every person, Do you believe that I'm your Lord? And everyone said, Bala, yes, we do believe. That was the covenant take from all human beings before we were created. As this covenant was taken, Another covenant was taken from Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam only. So Allah gathered Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam at that time. And he took a covenant from Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. You know what was that? Allah says and talks about it in Quran. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيثَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ Remember when Allah took the covenant from all the prophets of Allah. لَمَا آتَيْتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ If I give you my book, which means I send a divine book to you, wa hikmah, and I give you the wisdom, which means I keep on sending the revelation to you and the words of uh, wisdom to you. Thumma ja'akum rasul. Then a prophet, then if a prophet would come to you, la tu'mimusaddiqan lima ma'akum, who will be confirming what you people say, la tu'minunna bihi wa la tansurunna, that you are prophet of Allah. You will believe in that prophet and you would help that prophet. So they all said, Aqrarna, yes, we take that comment and we promise you Allah that we would do this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in spite of knowing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will come all the way at the end, but he is taking the covenant from all the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam that if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would come during your lifetime, then you have to believe in him. And you will have to, you will be one of his followers and helpers, then you won't be the one that will be followed anymore. You will follow him. Imam Tabari and many other scholars of Mufassirin have narrated on the authority of Ali radiallahu anhu that this Rasul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in this ayah is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if he would come, O prophets, you would believe in him and you would follow him. But not only this, Ali radiallahu anhu says, the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took this covenant from Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam because he wanted them to know how great of a prophet and a messenger he is. He knew he won't come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not going to come during that time. But just to let them know how great he is and how important he is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is telling them and through that, telling their ummas and telling us also that you have such a great prophet. That Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam were promised or were uh, asked to make a promise that they will follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if they would see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another sign of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's coming was, and something very unique with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we don't find it in the history of the world that happened with everyone, anyone else, that there were people who believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he came. Normally people will prophet, believe in the Prophet of Allah after a Prophet would come. But people believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he came. And in the history we find a lot of those incidents where people were waiting for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after seeing the description of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the previous books. They were waiting for him and 
they are looking forward for him to come out and they would believe in him. And some of them, they even left messages for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if you see that Prophet, let them know that I wanted to believe in him, I wanted to be his followers. One of those examples was Tubba. We talked about Tubba, he who was a king of Yemen. He came to fight the people of Medina Munawwara. And finally, he became a Jew as two Jewish leaders went to him. Rabbis went to him and they t- explained everything to him that this, this is the place where a prophet of Allah would come. And then he asked those people to go with him to Yemen. So he, they went to Yemen and finally this is how Judaism went to Yemen. And we talked about it in detail in our previous sessions. So Tubba, when he started reading Torah, he found the description of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he always used to hope that he would be able to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said some poems about the situation. The poems say as Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah has narrated his poems in Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, Shahidtu ala Ahmada annahu rasulun min Allahi bari an nasami. I witness for Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he is a messenger of Allah who will be very pure and clean. فَلَوْ مُدَّ عُمْرِي إِلَىٰ عُمْرِهِ لَكُنْتُ وَزِيرًا لَهُ وَابْنَ عَمِّي If I, my age, will help me and my life will help me to be alive at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would be his helper and his cousin. So, before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, this person is saying, I witness for him that he is a messenger of Allah. And there were some others also who witnessed for the Prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As a preparation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his coming, we know 55 days before the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the incident of the people of elephant took place. Abraha trying to attack Kaaba. And then being destroyed by that army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was sent in the form of birds. We talked about that also. That was one of the signs about the chain that was about to come in the world. And here we can see that only 55 days before the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that incident is taking place. That was part of the preparations for the coming of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, one of the other preparation that was made for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the water of Zamzam being available for people for their use again. We talked about Jirhum burying the well of Zamzam and throwing everything in it and covering it up so that Khuza'a won't be able to benefit from the water and they will suffer by bringing, having to bring water from far distances. And for long time, that well of Zamzam was covered and no one knew where it was. <coughs> for those of us who have visited that place, if you know where the well of Zamzam is, it's not adjacent to the Kaaba. It's between the Kaaba and Safa and Marwa. Almost halfway there. So it's not just adjacent to it, so a person will just dig a couple of places and will know that this is where the uh, well of Zamzam was. So no one knew where it was. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that preparation for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that before the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that became available for people. But before going into that, because that will lead us to a longer history, there was another preparation that we find and that was jinns were forbidden from sitting up on the heaven on listening to the angels. As they also mention, Quran speaks about them. They used to they used to have special places up in the heaven where they used to go and sit to listen to angels talking, then they would come back and tell the fortune tellers about it. And these fortune tellers now, of course, as they would hear a few things from these jinns, they would connect hundred more lies to it, and 
then they will tell people. For example, jinns heard that it will rain tomorrow. Angels were discussing it. It will rain tomorrow in that part of the land. So they heard it. So now the jinn will come and will tell the fortune teller that I heard the angels talking about it that it will be raining tomorrow. So now a person would come to this fortune teller and he says, I have this type of problem. He says, don't worry about it. Your problem will be solved. Everything will be taken care of if you do this, these, these. And for example, bow down before this idol. Pay this much of your fee to me. And we'll mention some more conditions, just as a matter of mentioning something. And the sign of you getting better is tomorrow it will rain. And that person will do all of this and it will see raining next day. And he says, see, really what he was talking was true. He knew what he was talking about. Another person would go to him. <coughs> that I'm about to start a business. What do you think? I will succeed or not? He'll say, yes, your business will succeed. Provided you do such, these, these, these things. And the sign of the success of your business and what I'm telling you is being true is it will rain tomorrow. So everything will be attached to raining tomorrow. So this is how they used to cheat people. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was born, at that time they were prevented from sitting over there. Their positions will be, were taken away. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa received the prophethood, another change was made to that and then they were shooed by the shooting stars also. Before that, they were not being shoot, but they were prevented from being over there. No more. You can't sit over there. Go back. But after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa received the prophethood, then the shooting stars will go and hit them. And this is why they were afraid to go up there. As I mentioned, one of the preparations is water of Zamzam being available for people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's Grandfather Abdul Muttalib. He saw a dream. Someone is telling him, dig the well of Zamzam. He didn't know how to do it. Next day he sees similar type of dream. Third day he sees another dream. And in all of these dreams, the message is, dig the well of Zamzam. Finally, he saw a dream. Someone is telling him where exactly the well of Zamzam was. So he went to the other leaders of Quraysh and he said, this is the dream I have been seeing continuously for many days. So I need you people to help me with digging of the well because I don't know how deep it will be, how long it will take for us to dig it. And it will take, of course, a lot of effort. And we may have to dig more than one place, couple of places to try to find the exact place of it. And that said, just depending on your dream, we keep on wasting our energy and time and keep on digging here and there around the Kaaba. We don't know what you're talking about and we can't help you with this. At that time, he had only one son whose name was Al-Harith. So he said to his son, son, now, only as two have to do it. And they went and started digging the well at a place where he, that was described to him in the dream as being the place of the well of Zamzam. And the dream was so exact and the description was so uh, to the point that at the first time, the first place where he started digging, he found the well of Zamzam. So, having the Zamzam available for people just before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and then through a dream and then having his own grandfather do it, all of these are signs that some change is coming and it's really a preparation for this person who's about to come, for that important person that was about to come. On the other hand, Abdul Muttalib, after finished digging the well of Zamzam, he realized that all of these people were not of any help to me. So he moved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you would give me ten sons, 
I would sacrifice one of my sons for your sake. Now, it's a very special type of uh, vow or a promise that I would sacrifice one of my sons. And here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him ten sons. After having ten sons, and of course, you know, that will take a long time, at least ten years, if not more. He forgot about that vow that he made. And one day he saw a dream, someone reminding him, how about that promise? He was truthful, he was honest, and therefore he remembered it, and as soon as he remembered it, he said, I'm going to do it. Now, which of the ten sons to sacrifice? So he said, we will vote on these. And he wrote the names of these ten sons on pieces of paper, and now pick up a paper. And as soon as they pick up a paper, the name of Abdullah comes out. Abdullah was the youngest of his sons, and was the dearest of his sons to him. He was hoping it will come the anyone's name other than Abdullah. But the name of Abdullah came out. So he said, I have to sacrifice Abdullah. People said, let's try it again. Do it three times. Second time, Abdullah's name would come out. Third time, and still Abdullah's name came out. And he knew that he is meant for that. And he took his son and started going to sacrifice him. When other people found out, and the word spread very fast throughout this town, all the people went after him, the leaders of Quraysh went after him, they said, we can't allow you to do that. If you would do that, and you are one of the leaders of Quraysh, then other peoples might follow you, and up to now we are only burying our daughters, now people will start slaughtering their sons. We can't allow this to happen. He said, but I have made that promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I was reminded through my dream also, I cannot change it. There is no way for me to change it. People were honest. They did not want to cheat. So finally, after a long discussion and a lot of argument, with Abdul Muttalib, they decided that there was a woman that was a fortune teller, very well known woman in her field. <clears throat> they said, We'll go to her and have her decide about it. When they went to her, she asked, according to your laws, laws in your town, how many camels do you offer as a ransom for a person? Which means if someone have killed a person, another person uh, in your community, how many camels do you have to offer as a ransom for uh, killing uh, an, an innocent person? Or killing a person by mistake? That's at 10 camels. So she said, then let's do this. Have 10 camels on one side and Abdullah on the other side. And keep on warring between the 10 camels and Abdullah. And each time if it will come the name of Abdullah, then add 10 more camels. So make them 20 and what again. If again Abdullah's name will come out, then add 10 more camels. Keep on doing that until... It will come on the camels, the vote will come on the camels, and then you sacrifice those many camels. So they started doing it. Ten and Abdullah, and it comes Abdullah's name. So ten more. Again, vote again, and Abdullah's name came out again. Again ten more. And they went up to hundred camels, and always Abdullah's name was coming out. Once they put hundred camels over there, and Abdullah on the other side, when they voted now, Abdullah, uh, the, uh, it came on the camel. That camel should be sla slaughtered now. Abdul Muttalib said, after those many, so many times, 
Only once Abdullah is now it came on the camels. So let's try two more times. To satisfy myself, I need this word to come on the camels three times at least. So they wanted three, two more times and each time now it will come on the camels to be slaughtered. And then Abdul Muttalib slaughtered those hundred camels and did not sacrifice his son Abdullah. This is the reason Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I'm the son of two of those who were about to sacrifice. Two of my fathers were about to be sacrificed. Abdullah and Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam by his father Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. As Abdullah grew up, he got married to a girl from Makkah, a very noble clan. Originally she was from Medina Munawwara. Her name was Amina. And of course we know in those days, people were in very much better situation than our situation nowadays, where they did not have to wait till they get into their 30s or 40s before they get their, their degrees and uh, have the work established to get married. They used to get married at early age. So, Abdullah got married and at that time, his wife Amina was only about 17 years old. After marriage, they had only a couple of months to stay together. And after that, Abdullah had to leave for a business trip. And that business trip, normally it would take two to three months. So Abdullah left for that with a promise that he will be, he'll try to come sooner. Amina is waiting for Abdullah to come back. Now imagine very newly married couple that lived together only for a couple of months. Now of course she will have to wait because that business trip was such that there is a whole caravan is going to go. A person cannot go by himself. He has to join that group. So if that will go away, then he won't find another one very soon. So he has to join them. So he had to leave. He was forced to leave. He left. And after about two to three months, everyone started hearing in Makkah that those people are coming back. And everyone is celebrating. Everyone is waiting. Of course, they did not have these means of communication that, okay, I'm coming right now. I'll be there. My flight will arrive this time. It's only people are saying that we saw them leaving Syria. So they should be here in two weeks. Now everyone is waiting every day. They are counting, okay, in about 13 days, in about 12 days, now five days, two days. And normally it will happen sometime. It would happen. Oh, they might be on their way. They did not arrive today. Everyone is out looking for them to receive them. And they don't find them. They wait from morning to evening. No one came there. So they will wait for another day. Okay, it might be tomorrow. They might have, must have got delayed for some reason. So let's go out tomorrow looking for them. Next day, some of the relatives are out looking for them. They didn't even come today. Okay, we'll go there tomorrow. And this is how it used to be. And you can imagine how difficult that wait is. At the, if you go to receive someone important at the airport, and the flight is only five minutes late, you know what the feelings are. Oh, five minutes, we have to wait. Okay, let's wait five more minutes. And if you're here, you have to wait ten more minutes. And after ten minutes, oh, they're saying it might take another half an hour. Just think how disturbed we get and how difficult that wait is. These are by minutes and hours and their waits were by days. <coughs> and I still don't know the situation. It might be tomorrow, it may not be. I, we don't know. Where are they now? And here, everyone is waiting and normally everyone would go out, but normally only men would go out. It still was a better jahiliyyah. 
that men would go out to receive their family members and women are waiting at their home. And every day Amina is waiting for that knock on the door that now at any time I would hear that, that they have arrived. And finally that day came when everyone is started saying that someone said, we saw them on our way and tomorrow they will be in Makkah. And here, they, everyone knew that tomorrow they are arriving and all the relatives <laughs> next day, they went out to receive them. Amina is waiting now at her home. And she is very anxiously waiting because she has a very special news for her husband that she is pregnant. She wants to give him that good news. And she's waiting. Someone is going to knock at her door. Soon now her husband Abdullah would come and knock at the door. And waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, someone knocked at the door. When she ran to the door, it was her grandfather. What happened to my husband? Where is he? Did he come? No, I'm sorry. He's sick. So therefore they left him in Medina. But he will come soon. Don't worry about him. He will come soon. Imagine what could be the situation of that girl. That young girl. Who had been waiting for such a long time. And again. Okay. Now again. Wait every day. Hoping that he would come tomorrow. The next day he will feel better. And now there is a worry there. That he's not feeling well. Of course she may not even think and will ever click to her mind that he will get very serious, but he was so bad that he couldn't travel. And therefore his Medina, so hopefully soon he would come, but I wish he was here so I could help him. I could do something for him. And every day she's requesting her father-in-law that please, could you send someone to bring him here because we would be taking care of him better than what he was, what anyone would do it in Medina. And he said, yes, let's hope that he will get better and he would come himself. Okay, tomorrow and next day. And finally, one day, she insisted that please, just send someone who can bring him. So he said, okay, I'll send my son, my other son who's going to bring him to Mecca. So he sent one of his sons to bring him. Now again, she knew that, okay, now tomorrow they are coming. And every day they are, she's waiting, now they will be coming. It's about time for them to come. And it was the day when they knew that, okay, tomorrow they are arriving. Next day she is waiting again. Waiting for her husband to come. Now, of course, she is all ready to take care of him. He is sick. And she, he needs a lot of attention. He needs help. I'm going to do everything I can for him. She is all ready for him. And again, she is waiting for that knock on the door. And... When the door was knocked and she opened the door, she saw her father-in-law again standing over there. What happened? Where is my husband? Said Amina, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you won't be able to see your husband again. He have died. He died in Medina. And, of course, she had nothing that she could do except to have patience and wait until she will have the son as a memory of her husband. This is what the mother went through and here we see that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam getting orphaned before even he was born. Inshallah in our next session we will talk about his birth and things that took place at the time of his birth and then his childhood. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين.